Phenomenology of Attunements, or the Unanswered Questions of How to Philosophize Musically. The main ideas I want to talk about today are attunement and qualitative multiplicity. My goal is that examining attunement will give us a sense of what qualitative multiplicity is. Both need to be understood through musicology, psychology, and phenomenology. Why did humans invent music? Just to relax and dance? Perhaps. But also, it seems to me, in an attempt to know ourselves, music can make sounds which imitate our inner life by setting in motion a flux of memories and emotions. A melody, by the charm of its gestural communication of feeling, invites us to deepen our experience, meditate, and reflect phenomenologically. Music both reflects and enriches the tendencies and intricacies of life. I use the term phenomenological, but I would also say metaphysical. Music is a way of engaging in metaphysics without concepts, which, according to Bergson, is the only way we can make any progress in metaphysics. Music teaches us to attune ourselves to movement, gesture, emotion, consciousness, and life itself, to be attentive and gather our memories and emotions. According to Leibniz, the joy of music is that we do math in our unconscious. What he meant is that we interact with the mathematical patterns of the sounds, but do so without using concepts or forming judgments. So it's unconscious or maybe quasi-conscious because we are able to feel its meaning rather than think it. We feel the quantities as qualities. Schopenhauer agreed but wanted to outdo Leibniz and said that music is unconscious metaphysics. Bergson thought it was capable of being a conscious metaphysics. Additionally, it provides phenomenologists a great place to conduct research, to learn more about consciousness. But music does more than serve philosophy. It foreshadows it, and it is its prior condition. Music has always already been the place where we have turned our consciousness in on itself, where we have let go of the train of thought always explaining experience to float in the flexible and dilating tensions of our enduring awareness, where a multiplicity of movements coalesce and contrast. Musicians, composers, performers, all have to develop phenomenological insights into emotions and attitudes and then find the gestures, intonations, rhythms, and patterns of sounds that succeed in suggesting these feelings to us. Today, we affirm the conventional and idiosyncratic aspects of musical expression, and we are right to do so. But we should not overlook the fact that on the one hand, film composers, for example, frequently succeed in making us feel what they want us to feel from the fear and anxiety of horror to the joy and sorrow of drama and the mystery and majesty of fantasy. And while all these emotions, emotional evocations are only possible in a cultural milieu in which the affects are already being cultivated, it is also the case that the multiplicity of sonic patternings afforded to us by nature by the nature of sound patterning itself, which is clearly an infinite potential, is a necessary condition to making music to begin with. I'll unpack all of this in more detail as we go. The power of music is astonishing, astonishingly multifaceted. It is obviously not only metaphysics and phenomenology, and in fact, it only reaches these levels of intensity and depth somewhat rarely. It is also a simple joy, offering us relaxation and amusement, Despite sometimes being sublime, transcendent, and invigorating, it can nonetheless be banal or hypnotizing at other times. It can both wake us up and put us to sleep. One moment we are singing a half-hearted happy birthday in its all too frequent arrhythmic cacophony, or suddenly you find yourself compulsively humming a fast food jingle to your own frustration. Again, at other times, music touches us on the deepest level, we are gripped by wonder, sorrow, nostalgia, inspiration, or something far more profound, more difficult to describe, something almost mystical. The intense mystical experiences involve what we could call altered states of consciousness. Music can have effects similar to meditation, a day at the spa, yoga, 
a psychedelic trip, even psychotherapy or spiritual healing. And a lot of the time we want to, we don't want, a lot of the time we want to do these sorts of things with music. This multiplicity of divergent tendencies and effects of music was discussed by Aristotle. He made distinctions, as he was prone to do, between at least five irreducible ways that music factors into human life and affects the psyche. It can be a trivial amusement, even a distraction, but it can also be a useful tool in education and can provide support for ethical development. Following Plato and ancient mythology, music was seen as a divine force manifest in nature, reason woven into chaos, beauty emerging of its own accord from the toil and turmoil of the human condition. Orpheus's fabled melodies were so potent they could charm any animal, human or god, and could even bring rocks to life. And following Pythagoras, Pythagoras, musical harmony is the very animating principle of the cosmos, the world soul. Life and mind are what tune and harmonize the movements of nature. In profound musical experiences, we witness something fundamental about nature and human life. Its significance becomes existential, its value sacred, it enhances our greatest joys, consoles our deepest griefs without hiding them from us. Music can help us feel our most agonizing and melancholic emotions, heartbreak, loss, and death, more viscerally and openly, and thus more truly. We have all witnessed an intensely moving musical experience. It is humbling and inspiring, along with the aesthetic joys. There is an additional development in feeling, something more akin to moral feeling, sympathy, which involves veneration, emulation, and a sense of magnanimity, and even spiritual nobility. We are not merely impressed a word which has the connotation of mechanical passivity and shallowness, but rather we are inspired, an activity with vivacity involving imagination and a sense of purpose. Between the extremes of mundane and profound lies the everyday enjoyment we get from listening to music while we drive, exercise, or cook dinner. This joy merges with the very will to endure an existence, and more importantly, our effort to adapt and improvise. It's what Spinoza called the Conatus or Bergson, the Elan Vital. To go from surviving to living well, not merely an inertia to continue, but to grow and transform. Despite music's ubiquity in human life, there is no such thing as an average everyday form of music, nor a natural one. There is no single way of listening to, make, listening to or making music nor can there be a standalone concept that would grasp all the many diverse aspects of music and give us a single definition adequate to them all. Music has decided to be at variance with itself and multiplies like the heads of a hydra as we analyze it. How is one to philosophize about something so far-reaching and seemingly without a center? According to Leonard Bernstein, This is the great unanswered question, probed but left open by Charles Ives. What, after all, is music? He reframes the question. Where does music come from, and where is it going? The slow, sustained, purely diatonic background, the trumpet intermittently poses his question, a vague, non-tonal phrase. Whence and whither, where is music come from and where is it going? And each time it is answered by the wind group in an equally vague, amorphous way. This question of the origin and direction of movement, of music, whither, and whence is inextricable from the depths of our existential predicaments and the heights of our most exalted aspirations. Music is strung inextricably between our divinity, animality, materiality. The nature or spirit of music, 
wherever it come, wherever it's coming from and wherever it's going, consists more in entertaining, pondering, probing, and evolving this question rather than giving a final answer. We will settle now for a more attainable question. What is attunement? Now, one reason that music can be so profound is that it mixes feelings and sensations in a way that builds and develops over time, like a train of thought, but without concepts. Music's sonic patterning favors associations with emotions and vague memories over thoughts and descriptions. Music has nevertheless become an object of science and criticism, something to be measured and conceptualized rather than felt. It has been reduced to a quantitative multiplicity. This is helpful, but only in a limited way. On its own, quantity and concepts are never enough. Prodigies often make no use of notation, and it frequently stifles the learning process, leading students to prematurely lose interest in playing. Style and feel, which most often come with years of experience, remain embodied and gestural. Swing and groove, just as much as grace and expressivity, are produced and appreciated on a pre-linguistic, pre-conceptual level of understanding. What does it take to actively develop the multiplicity and unity of musical movements? I will argue it takes passion, experience, and the subtle emotional and embodied intelligence that does not think in words but creates a new meaning which calls for the invention of a new word. If we truly understand our consciousness and its potential, our consciousness would grow and evolve. It would mean that we invent a new form of knowledge and consciousness. A new form of consciousness emerged when our ancient an ancestors got the idea, without using words, to invent language, to make a constant uh, concatenation of bizarre sounds with the idea that these sounds will somehow coalesce into a whole, which will make another person's consciousness resonate with one's own. None of this existed in concepts, but the intention was there. No doubt, our ancestors were inspired by music and gesture, which had already been their vehicle of meaning. Intellectualism, reductionism, industrialism, colonialism have pretended that they leave behind the musical and gestural meaning entirely to enter this fantastical domain of pure, dispassionate concepts. Music continues to prove to be a powerful means for subverting these tendencies. The way we consume music today in Walter Benjamin's so-called age of mechanical reproduction is quite different from music heard in the age of classical Athenian philosophy. Despite the abyss between us and the ancient people, the importance of music and the diversity of ways it is woven into people's daily lives is the same. Music was as pervasive and meaningful for them as it is for us. Furthermore, its importance for Greek philosophy can hardly be overstated. One of the most beloved Greek philosophers, Socrates, on the day of his death, was writing songs of his own and declared that philosophy is the greatest music. Arguably, Plato had not only a philosophy of music, but a veritable musical philosophy, borrowing a phrase of Paul Valéry, of poet Paul Valéry, which was echoed by the Bergsonian philosopher and musicologist Vladimir Shankelevich. Pythagorean musical cosmology systematized by Philolaus uh, and adopted into Athenian philosophy by Socrates centers on the terms tonos, from which we get our word tone, and harmonia, from which we get our word harmony. These terms played important roles in metaphysics, psychology, ethics, and political philosophy from Heraclitus to Claudius Ptolemy, and even on to the Stoics and the Neoplatonists. Both terms have several connotations, but generally mean attunement, as it applies both to the musical intervals and the moods or state of the soul. Tonos, when used in non-musical contexts, means effort, psychical tension, and everything related to attitude, attention, intention. This is not merely a verbal ambiguity of unrelated equivocations, but is a clever insight into a profound analogy and continuity. These parallels, th these parallels are also exemplified by the fact that certain modes, musical scales, 
are better suited to eliciting certain moods. The composer will often switch from a major to a minor scale to shift and shape the emotional quality of the song. I'll give further examples of these in a minute. Tonos includes, but is not limited to, the scale, the key, the pitch, but also the particular style of the melody and the feel of the rhythm. Armonia further augments this meaning cluster by bringing in a sense from carpentry of fitting together. It names this complex unity greater than the sum of the parts, connecting without homogenizing. Harmony is an immediate contrast apparent without any external mediation, blending into an indivisible whole without leveling the differences among the ingredients. The strings on the harp are in tune with each other, but each has its own unique pitch and tone, and each can serve as the key center, the reference point from which the rest of the notes are arranged. And this is called modulation, and again, I'm gonna give an example of this in a minute. A plurality of voices sing together. A multitude of pitches in a chord form a whole. The nuances of variation of volume, emphasis, and timbre all coalesce to form the style and overall feeling of the song. In harmony, multiplicity fits together in a complex and concrete unity. The sonic flux of details and contrasts coexist in the song and find unity without erasing the differences. Likewise, the musician modulates and attunes their attitude, regulates their emotions to bring to life the song they are performing. Attentive listeners tend to follow suit and tune their own souls. We feel and move as one while remaining distinct. As with Simon and Garfunkel, the whole that they form together is something more than each of them playing alone. It's a harmony of souls and bodies that brings about a novel, sui generis quality, form, feeling, potential that is only there in combination. Melodic music called melos or melodes involves the physical harmony between sounds and an organization of rhythmic patterns in time as much as it does the attunement of the consciousness that attends to, cares for, and shapes the sounds so as to be musical. To study music, one must study the vicissitudes of the psyche with its moods, wants, passions, its agony, and its ecstasy. The musician learns to shape sounds in such a way that the sonic whole is attuned to the pattern of shifting states of the soul, intentionally yet indirectly sculpting a journey of evolving emotions. Every melody has a tonality of its own. So I need to explain a little bit about what tonality is. If I have a low note playing, this is going to set the atmosphere for interpreting the higher notes. If I play there, that's a major scale. But if I switch this low note here, and I play those exact same notes, it's going to give me a different sounding scale. Because I'm hearing it now from this reference point. So let's take this basic pattern here. We can think of it as one, five, four, three. And we start with this low note, which contextualizes it as this major chord. And now here, what I'm doing is I'm moving these bass notes up and that's recontextualizing the same pattern in a different atmosphere, in a different tonality. And this is a sort of small way of modulating. And with all these examples, I'm not repeating this bass movement at all. So each time we're getting a unique qualitative feel with this pattern. Okay, so that's back now repeating the first one, but 
What we can also do is slightly vary the pattern of notes that we have playing at the top. So if we move just one of those notes here up to here, then we're going to get this. And this is a true modulation. Giving us the Lydian. And there's another modulation. So instead of changing this third note, I changed the fourth note. So the third note there was back to normal. And then the fourth note was off very slightly. And both of these create new modes, new uh, tonal perspectives from which we organize our scale. And the ancient Greeks actually had multiple forms of attunements. So in addition to this modal music that I've just shown you, this way of switching the scales uh, emotion by changing the tonality, they had another way of modulating um, and a more complicated sense by fine tuning these note relations. Uh, Ptolemy calls this hermosmenon. These attunements are a method of micro tuning that lets musicians significantly alter the overall tonal and melodic feel of their music by modulating between slight variations often referred to as intonation or temperament. Ptolemy named several of them, the tonic diatonic, the tense diatonic, the soft diatonic, and the even diatonic. Now, each one of these uses unique interval structures, unique micro-tuned intervals. Um, so, for instance, Pythagorean uses these intervals. It starts with what is called a fifth, perfect fifth and then it stacks that same interval going up by the same amount each time and this was how Pythagoras tuned his scale and then we have the five limit which uses this other interval and then the Architas soft diatonic uses what's called the seventh partial. It has this kind of sentimental, sad sense to it. And lastly here, I'll just look quickly at the even diatonic, this 11 limit that Ptolemy tells us about. It uses this very strange interval here, which is based on the 11th harmonic in the harmonic series. There it is, the 11th harmonic. Okay, so what am I talking about there? Here's an example of Architas's tuning. Plato's Pythagorean friend Architas of Tarentum was the most advanced theorist of the classical period. His soft diatonic was a heptatonic seven note scale built on two tetrachords with the following whole number fractions. 28 over 27, 32 over 27, and 4 over 3. Each attunement avails unique emotional tonality, what Aristotle's student Aristoxenus of Tarentum called shadings, chroma. I'll be presenting on the phenomenological aspects of Architas and Aristoxenus this summer at a conference in Sicily, which I'm really excited about. Ta Ptolemy recorded and synthesized the prior theories of harmonics spanning from, Pythag from the Pythagoreans and Peripatetics and many other minor theories and gave us what we know today as just intonation. And it's thanks to him that we have these scales recorded. 
Um, and as I mentioned before, they are based on the harmonic series. The harmonic series is a naturally occurring, you could say, pattern of vibration that occurs within any vibrating body based on integer series divisions of space. And I have this represented here in terms of sine waves through the middle and then a Fourier, Fourier transform of them projected over top. The harmonic series is a series of divisions of space, as I said, and we can see this quite easily on a guitar. If I put my finger in the middle, or a one-third, one-fourth, one-fifth, one-sixth, I can move up, and I can actually tune this guitar to those intervals, so... So that then... And even this weird seventh... So now, they are all in tune with each other based on pure whole number divisions of space. And what this causes is a specific form of sympathetic resonance. So if I play the main string, the low string, all the other strings have begun to move. And if I put my finger down on it and stop it, you can hear them all singing along afterwards because they vibrate in tandem with this higher frequency or with this, um, sorry, lower frequency, because they share these overtonal relations, which is really just a pattern of vibrating. So the overtone series is integer divisions of space, and this starts with what we would call the octave. The octave is twice, a movement twice in the same period. And then next we have moving three times in the same period then four times, and then five times, and then six times, and then seven times, and then again an octave eight times, and nine times. And you can hear that this is a lot of information, and you can see here that is clearly a very complicated process that is making this sound and the harmonic series actually continues to go on and grow in complexity it goes 11 12 13 14 15 and this 15th harmonic in the context of right now sounds pretty insane and crazy but if i stop all the other notes and play only a few it's actually very beautiful. So the harmonic series has a lot of different movements in different directions. It has this feel. It also has this. And it also has this. So it affords us a lot of different sounds and a lot of different qualities. And I've created this 12-tone scale based on the harmonic series so that there are 12 notes and they all exist in the position that they do within the harmonic series so i'm not going to go into any more detail on this but there you have it and um you know digital technologies are helping us overcome the challenges posed by harmonically complex tunings and i'm not going to burden you with that but it's helping reopen this untapped potential. And Wendy Carlos was a pioneer of synthesizer music who invented several attunements of her own. She became famous for her 1968 album, Switched on Bach, and is known especially for her films, film scores such as The Shining, Clockwork Orange, and Tron. And here you can hear some of her music written in these odd tunings.
There's a great deal of expressive possibility, subtle nuance, and novel complexity to be found and formed in certain micro changes to our tuning systems. This goes far beyond the ancient Mediterranean. Blues and jazz artists have long been bending the notes outside of the bounds of modern mechanically reproduced rigidity. In order to play the natural seventh, you just bend the sixth up. And you can hear that. And in order to play the neutral third, the eleventh harmonic, you just bend the minor third up slightly. So that note is halfway between a major third and a minor third. And in the context of blues, it makes perfect sense, feels great. Cultures around the world have been making use of different intonations for a long time. Such as in Tuvan throat singing. This band is great. Alash, I just saw them in State College actually not too long ago. Those higher notes you're hearing are harmonics created from the lower pitch of his voice by him changing the shape of his, vo of his mouth. Also in gamelan music, of jo uh, Javanese and Balinese music cultures, they have perhaps gone the furthest in the direction of developing harmonic complexity. They use scales and tune their instruments in ways that generally baffles anyone not trained in their systems. This added complexity of attunement opens new horizons of musical expressivity, which alas calls for an encounter with the whole number of fractions, the harmonic series, where music remains rooted the natural behavior of sound vibrations. We only learn to use these sounds musically after we have long and careful observation with them. We must conduct this in the imaginative free spirit of play. We must become friends with the sounds. Around 2021, I started playing and composing in ancient Greek tunings described above. Rather than attempt to replicate the style or melody of ancient Greek music, I have been working with Jonathan Kay of East-West Psychology and trying to make something new with these attunements, breathing fresh life into them with our own inspirations and inventiveness. The Architas blip above with piano and sax was one of ours. When learning to play different attunements, as found in both these modulations of tonal centers as well as in the methods of microtuning, it's never enough for one to simply learn to play and memorize scales. We must also learn how to play them musically. In a similar manner, the art of orchestration draws more out of the melody by selecting the instrumentation which best exaggerates and enhances the intended feelings. We can go a step further and fine-tune each scale by making it more in tune with the song. The melody is attuned to the tuning when it becomes more expressive of the attitude and style of the melody. By analogy, the philosopher must do more than engage in arguments and explanations. There, is, there are attunements of the psyche, attitudes, passions, temperaments, the influence of which makes or breaks philosophical viability of thinking and discourse. Along with thinking, we need philosophical temperaments, tenor, expertise, a spirit of fairness, a yearning for truth, a courage to admit our errors, confront our ignorance, and work in open dialogue with others. The phenomenological attitude is the core truth of phenomenology, that we can cultivate it and that our efforts actually get us somewhere. Philosophical discourse provides an occasion to collectively work together to better attune ourselves to one another and to the work of philosophy. Philosophy has the dual task of modulating the attunement of consciousness 
as well as of understanding these changes of attunement. Phenomenological reflection on music unleashes an entire metaphysics of psychical energy and emergence. Melody and rhythm are irreducible to the sounds considered as an aggregate. The feeling and charm of a song cannot be reduced to an analysis of the parts and patterns. It's no surprise that Gestalt psychologists and phenomenologists turn to music to understand perception, consciousness, and meaning. While music plays an integral part in understanding consciousness, it also goes beyond the narrow limits of spotlight awareness. Bergsonian musicologist Shankelevich insisted that music is ineffable and brings our attention to its ephemerality. Je ne sais quoi and presque rien. We cannot say exactly what it is, je ne sais quoi, and yet the immediate feeling of it is singularly profound, true, and meaningful. In a flash, it is gone. A great piece of music, as well as the state of rapture we enjoy in its duration, is while it's unfolding, is a transient and fleeting bliss that can only be lived in time. We cannot hold and examine its essence at our leisure. It constantly runs away from us and disappears into science, into silence. <laughs> What could be more mysterious and metaphysical than this concrete, embodied, almost nothing, presque young, a hidden harmony like Heraclitus' fire that simultaneously connects and contrasts everything? Music is meaning in an embryonic state of flux, forming precipitously into organized patterns and evolving through transformations more radical than a frog or a butterfly. It is the very creative power of the Alain Vital, of life's inventiveness. Music is a continuously renewed adaptation and evolution of our attempts to better know ourselves and each other. Philosophy is our attempt to make music with words. Can there be a science of music or criticism worth anything without the spirit of joy, creativity, and imagination that are the origin of music and are harmonized together in a sort of musical wisdom. Every analysis calls for a higher order intuition, one which the diverse thoughts and measurements on their own do not contain and presupposes the passion and context without which the creation of science would never have been undertaken. Is not our love of music the first and most enduring relation we have to it? Are we not called to offer our reverence to the musical events before analyzing and criticizing them? Do we not devote our attention to the song, praising the musicians with applause and enjoying the event with others by clapping, singing, or dancing, first and foremost because we love music? Glenn Gold. One of the most acclaimed classical keyboard performers of the modern era received such harsh reviews from critics following the release of his recordings of Bach's Art of the Fugue that he never finished the project and canceled his plans to record Mendelssohn's organ sonatas. How easily the generous and playful spirit of music can wither in the harsh light of judgment and derision. How many people think they are tone deaf, something that does not exist, because someone slapped them with a mean-spirited insult. While passion and affection are the sometimes feeble beginning and source of music, Aspiration, imagination, and perhaps above all, a sense of the sacred are what propel us to the sublime summit of free expression and emotional transformation. Music does more than teach us about ourselves and our emotions. It refutes reductionism, provides us with a foundation for psychology and metaphysics, dissipates the meaning crisis, and I think will propel us into the revolutions political and spiritual. Music is never a solitary experience. The listener feels a connection to the player. The sounds create an atmosphere. They suggest a world that the listener takes up. But even for the lone musician, the instrument becomes their comrade in song, and the player listens to the instrument as much as they play it. This is the profound power of attunement. Hearing an ancient melody feels like time travel not merely preserving sounds, but of connecting souls. When we hear this hurry in him, we are placed in the immediate proximity of a vitality and duration of a life separated by 3,000 years. 
This tune, the oldest remains of music, was likely already an ancient melody to those who pressed it into clay. We can also hear in ancient melodies a voice of the future, of aspiration, anticipation, and hope. The immense powers of music to transform the psyche have not gone unnoticed in the political sphere, where music has been used for everything from propaganda of oppression to carrying the voices of liberation. While we must reject and resist the oppressive hierarchies adopted and defended in Aristotelian political theory, we can still learn a good deal from his writings about the psyche, especially with respect to the effects of music and community. To be inspired philosophically does not mean simply emulating prior thinkers. It means going further and evolving. We must become imbued with their attentive openness to wonder, their courage to face their ignorance, and their communal approach to knowledge production. We use this energy and care to begin anew, now, in our time, with our problems, to philosophize and to integrate the movement of science, art, politics, and uncompromising self-improvement. In the spirit of Socrates' musical philosophy, music is and will continue to be a most precious resource for emancipatory and progressive politics, and part of this might in fact emanate from its more mundane aspect, the simple joys of free play. Now, before we queue up the video for people all over the world or sing Kumbaya, and all irony aside, I believe music can provide us with the occasion to practice working together in loving participation, to conspire in communal and concerted action. Music inspires collaboration, innovation, and inventiveness, the psychical and physical synergies without which we will not manage to bring about the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. I'll end by saying that just as dissonance and te tension provide an indispensable good for musical expression, so too anger and indignation are necessary political affects reflecting deep moral intuitions and self-determination. Numerous countercultural movements have produced aesthetics that incorporate anger, although metal probably goes the furthest. I've been a metalhead for many years and can say firsthand that being in a mosh pit can be an intense but also a profound experience. The quality of the mosh pit varies quite drastically with the type of fans the band attracts. Some have more of your belligerent, angry men trying to hurt each other. Um, but often, and at least with the bands that I like and I've gone to, they are mosh pits are filled with people who are trying to keep each other safe while obviously also pushing each other around and headbanging and all of that and having a good time. <laughs> 